My topic is the trial of the plaintiff's case. And I've been instructed, and it's hard for me to follow instructions, but I'm going to do it, to follow the agenda that you have, which is A, preparation, cost, time, and putting it together. Uh, and I'm going to do that. And I'm going to maybe overlap a little with what Brian said by necessity. Uh, let me say one thing about mediation from a plaintiff's standpoint, because I looked at the uh, roster here, and I think all but two or three people are on the defense side, correct? Who's on the plaintiff's side? Two, maybe. Three. Okay, so I'm right. Okay, don't forget, so for you defendants, don't remember this. I'm just visiting. Okay, man. Uh, the, uh, as to mediation, as a plaintiff, not 100% of the time, but almost, I will never, ever ask a defendant if they want to mediate the case. To me, it shows weakness. And the only exception is if I know the, the other side and they've spoken to me and I get some <coughs> indication that they want to do something, and I can see that the parameters they're thinking are within my parameters, then I might bring it up and say, okay, uh, go ahead. But what you can, and they'll, a lot of times, uh, in fact, recently, it's, they've always been picking Judge de Blasi. I mean, defendants seem to like him, and I have no problem with him, because he's right down the middle. And, uh, and he usually gets the cases settled. If not there, he will really follow up with everybody on your cell phones and emails and try and move it. So I just wanted to make that comment. Okay, preparation, cost, time, and putting it together. <clears throat> this is where I have to overlap a little bit with Brian because uh, the, the preparation of a product liability case, and really any case, but more, much more so in a product liability case, begins the minute you decide you're either going to take the case or look into it. And a lot of times in a product liability case, you're going to have to put out some big money before you know whether you have a case. So, what Brian said is absolutely true. We will not even look at a product liability case unless it's well in excess of a million dollars because of the tremendous amount of money involved that we have to outlay. Uh, I think Brian said he hasn't seen a case uh, Le that uh, less than a, a half a million dollars was spent on, and he's dealing with them after the trial. He's absolutely right. I have cases that have that are in suit, haven't gotten to trial yet, where I have three or four hundred thousand dollars expended already. So it doesn't make sense. I, I get calls all day long on product cases. I lost a finger. I lost the tip of it. I had a fractured ankle with an open reduction and, and place and strip. It's just not worth it. This is too labor intensive, time intensive, and you also have to learn engineering. <coughs> Secondly, uh, well, let me just make one exception. The only time I'll take a case that's worth, that's worth maybe seven, eight hundred thousand dollars is if I've litigated that same machine before. Uh, in the 80s, I used to handle a lot of offset printing press cases. They don't, I don't think they even use offset <laughs> printing presses. And there's a famous company in Germany that manufactured printing presses, I, and everybody probably knows who they are, but, uh, and on printing presses, uh, there's rollers and there's what's called in running nip points and what's called hickeys, impurities on the plate cylinders uh, uh, used to uh, would form. And it was known that print, print press operators would chase hickeys. They take a rig with a press in motion, they put their finger on it, take a rig, and their arm would go in and they'd lose a hand, they'd lose the arm up to the elbow. And uh, of course, in those days and even now, the employer could be brought into the case. And I've had, had those cases where they were just crush injuries without loss of use, but I've litigated so many on the failure to interlock theory, uh, and I had good experts on it, so I would take a case like that. Also, I, I, I settled the panel cutting case uh, 
in mediation, uh, the defendants had asked to go uh, with Judge de Blasi, where the plaintiff was, did everything wrong. And I'm going to get into that for a minute. In, in these cases, and I'm going to be talking today about, because it's the, you're going to see most of them and they're more interesting, I'm going to be talking about the failure to warrant defective design cases as opposed to manufacturing defect or manufacturing flaw cases. Uh, most of the cases I see are design defect cases and failure to warrant. That said, I would, I, I would, I, I love to take a case if I, my only theory is a failure to warn. But, but the fact is, if you have a failure to warn case, you're usually going to have a design defect case because the warnings that are inadequate that you're going to be saying are inadequate uh, were inadequate because they failed to fully inform the user of the machine or the product of uh, dangers associated because of the design of the machine. Okay, so secondly, another reason you have to be very careful about these cases. You're going to uh, be going up, there it is, you're going to be going up against really, really top flight attorneys. These aren't uh, run of the mill attorneys. These are attorneys like John McDonough who do product liability cases over and over and over again. Secondly, in a lot of the uh, cases with American manufacturers or even European manufacturers, I just had one recently, they have national counsel in the United States. And na the national counsel is going to know the particular product called because they've litigated that product before. And uh, what they'll do is pro hoc into New York, associate with a New York firm. Uh, some of them will let the New York firm, if they're smart, do a lot of the work. Some of them, and I was lucky in a case, that don't, and uh, they get burned. But uh, for me, if I was a defendant and I was a national, had a national counsel for X manufacturer, and I had a case in New York, I would get uh, local counsel, uh, uh, Cosmo O'Connor John's firm, or Goldberg's and Gallup, one of the really good firms. And I'd really let them handle a lot of this stuff. But you know, you see, we see as plaintiffs that that doesn't happen. They get people just to run to court. And, and sometimes they can handle it, but oftentimes uh, you'll find that you, you, you'll get a uh, real break. But uh, also, manufacturers <coughs> are very, very, proud of their products. They aren't going to roll over and play dead, as Brian said on this appeal where they spent $2 million, and especially the Japanese manufacturers. Don't go, you can never go into a product liability case, and you should go not go into any case thinking you're going to settle it, because as we all know, cases that could, uh, get prepared to be settled get tried, and cases that get prepared to be tried usually will be settled if they're good cases, and you know what you're doing. Uh, but uh, don't forget, in a products case, you're going to be going up against highly qualified, highly experienced attorneys who have access to the very best experts. They not only have the experts who designed the machine, they have experts, and there's a, several companies they use, which, uh, which I don't have to name, but there's several companies throughout the country that employ former design engineers, uh, 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 civil engineers, whatever, who worked in the industry and may have worked for the same manufacturer. Don't, don't know any of them. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to understand that. Now, <coughs> putting it together, you have to be prepared as you would be in a medical malpractice case where you have to learn the medicine as well as the doctor that you're going to propose, you must learn the principles of design engineering as a plaintiff. And uh, I'll talk to you about them in a minute. Uh, you also must choose the right expert. If you take a product liability case, 
and you get one of these jack-of-all-trade experts that we all know who testify in slip and fall cases, uh, uh, accident reconstruction cases, uh, wet floor, whatever, the defendant's going to laugh at you. Uh, they're not qualified. I put in, in my, uh, uh, in my uh, submission, which we don't, you have, I think, on access to on the internet these days. You can order it for 20 bucks, which I just ordered it because I wanted to get Brian's out. <laughs> <laughs> but I, he'd give it to me if I called them up. But I wanted to see what the outlines are because a lot of them are from the defense uh, perspective. So it's 20 bucks, you can, you can order it. I'm not pushing to, uh, for the state bar, I'm just saying I ordered it. But uh, so, when you're choosing a liability expert, you must get case-specific experts because you're going to get either a Fry motion, a Daubert motion, or just a summary judgment motion to dismiss your case. You have to understand that. And from the get-go, you have to be prepared to first not lose the summary judgment motion and secondly, to be able to prevail at trial. And to do that, you really need good experts. You need experts that actually work in the industry. And before, if you've never worked with the expert before, you have to meet with the expert. Do never retain an expert in a product liability case without having a face-to-face -face sit down with that expert whether you have to fly to California, Hawaii, wherever you have to go, <coughs> go meet with that expert. Because you don't want to be surprised when you first see the expert, when he comes in to do the pre-action uh, inspection of the product, which you're going to have, and you get a court order to do it, or you may get it voluntarily if it's, a, if it's a, an employee scenario where, you, and that's the kind of case I like the best, obviously, with, if you have a grave injury where you have a, a worker who was injured on the job uh, and, uh, and, and we can, we're claiming the product was effective, but as often happens uh, in these cases, the employer lowered the guard or took the guard off or whatever and most of the liability is going to fall on the employer so that if you have a manufacturer who has enough insurance so you can get your pass through, because if they don't, if the, if the manufacturer can't pay off the uh, verdict, you're never going to get to the next level because they have to pay it off. But Brian obviously can tell you a lot more about that than I can, but that's basically the rules. So before you go to uh, look at the product, you're going to go meet with that expert if you, if you don't know the expert. Now, I've been doing this a long, long time, so most of the experts I use or their companies, I know I can trust. And uh, I might not, in those circumstances, go meet with an expert. But you have to sit down with the expert and, and, and go over the educational background, the grades, because people like John are going to have their transcripts. I've, this happens. They, get, they have their college transcripts, their uh, graduate school transcripts, their uh, PhD transcripts. Sometimes they'll even have their thesis. So you better get all that stuff from them. You better find out if they've ever been fried or dalbertized. You, you want an expert, if possible, who's actually designed machines. If not the exact machine involved, similar machine. You want an expert who's had patents. Uh, you want, in effect, a real expert, not a, you know, <laughs> one of those people that, uh, that we see all the time. And I've actually seen in product cases that I've inherited, I said, oh my God, the defendants must be laughing. And we all know the experts I'm talking about. They might be fine in a slip and fall case, they're not fine in a product liability case because they have no experience. If you have a uh, roof crush case, uh, against the auto manufacturer, defendants are going to have the best experts in, in the industry coming against, in against you. Uh, they're going to make, use a company like Failure Analysis Associates who will not come in for plaintiffs and products cases. By the way, they will come in in non certain non-product cases. But you're going to have people with 
great credentials. So you have to go out and, 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 and in those cases and get people who actually have worked in the automotive industry, who have actually designed cars, who have, have been in, uh, uh, who are able to do design drawings because you're going to want your expert when you're saying there's an alternative to design, uh, the expert's going to have to design that for you. And the expert's going to have to be able to do design drawings. And the expert's going to have to, use most of the time, build a model or go out and buy the same product used and redesign it. We've done this too. Uh, for instance, uh, years ago there used to be a lot of one mower cases. Because the, and in fact, this guy Vern Roberts, you remember Vern, wrote a book, and I used to use it. Uh, it was called uh, "Power Lawnmower is an Unreasonably Dangerous Product," something like that. And it was great, uh, uh, Mr. Expert. Have you ever heard of this uh, book, uh, "Power Lawnmower is an Unreasonably <coughs> Dangerous Product"? Uh, yeah, well, it's authoritative, isn't it? No, well, but you've gotten so so all of the safety devices. Uh, seat kill switches in, in power lawn mowers, uh, uh, the three second brake clutches in, in, push, in the push mower, they've all been incorporated. You don't see lawn mower cases anymore. Be it's too bad for all of us, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but they put all these. Except the guy who still has his foot. <laughs> True. Exactly. So, uh, so I had, I had a, uh, what's called a skid steer loader case once, okay? So this is the expense, I'm going into this for the expense. Uh, and uh, skid steer loaders, and I'll, they're, 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 called, they're known to lay people as bobcats. Some of you may know that term, and that's a particular manufactured part, right? Who, ma who made uh, bobcats. And what they are, uh, the, the operator sits in an enclosed compartment, and now you'll see them with big uh, 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 screens around them, in a cage they sit in. Because the arms, the lifting arms, unlike the, the front unloader, are behind the operator. So they come up like this, right? You follow me? That's how I open to the jury. They come up like this. So if the screens aren't in there, and the operator happens to lean out and hits the Throttle by mistake, and up he got, up and, and my guy was killed. He was crushed to death. And they didn't have, they had screens, but you could pop them out like a window. There was no interlock or limit switch. It would have been easy to put a limit switch. A limit switch is what you see in a washer dryer. When you open the uh, door, the button pops out, and that kills the circuit. Okay, so we were arguing there should be a limit switch. They could have had a seat kill switch. And, and at that time, I think it was Clark, it was one of the manufacturers had incorporated the seat kill switch in the exact same machine. So we went out and bought that machine and videoed it with, with uh, the expert and his assistant. And we had him, you know, get off the seat to lean out as the bars were coming, as, as the forks that were coming up and it immediately stopped, and that was very, very effective. Uh, you also may have to have your expert build a model at a thermoforming machine case where the guy fell into it and lost his arm, and in that case, uh, the machine really was cannibalized. I always thought I'd lose uh, on a summary judgment motion under the Robinson line of cases if they'd been watered down, but still, this was, but I was in Brooklyn before a, a well-known judge who didn't like to read huge motion papers, and it was National Council from Chicago, and they did the best set of motion papers I've ever seen, color schematics, everything, but they were this big. So I said, okay, I, I'll oppose this, and I made mine that big. And so we go in to court to argue, and, and, and the uh, lawyer from Chicago gets up to argue that, and finally, the judge says, sit down, would you? And, and, uh, and uh, I get up to argue, and uh, the judge says, Mr. Gay, what, what are you standing up for? I go, judge, I thought, I said, yeah, this is a death case. 
question of fact. <laughs> <laughs> and that's one reason. That, that's one reason. That's one reason. And I'm going to talk to you about it. You want to try and bust diversity in these cases as a plaintiff. Uh, if you, tell me, do you disagree with me? I do not. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. So, as far as choosing uh, the liability uh, uh, expert, you want a real expert. You're going to, as Brian said, interview that expert. You're going to cross examine that expert. You want to know his whole work experience, the professional organizations he belongs to, and not the ones where you can send in 50 bucks and become a member. You want, and if possible, because I'll tell you right now, every one of the experts, a uh, 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 defense attorney like John will bring in, has probably been on an ANSI standard committee and had input into writing the standards and many of them may have been a chair of a subcommittee. So you want to try and get experts who have also participated in ANSI, uh, have participated in promulgating standards, because that's what you're going to be up against. Now, uh, you have to go over with your expert the protocol that the expert is going to be using for testing, uh, whether the methodology can be replicated, all, all of the things that the expert is going to be challenged on when the defense tries to knock them out. Uh, and uh, you have to, simply put, have a step-by-step -step description of all tests done. Now, In order to handle this case, as I said, I want to get into it a little, a little specifically, a design defect case. There's no reason as a plaintiff's attorney to handle a design defect case unless you're willing to learn the principles of design engineering theory. If you don't learn them, it's like taking a deposition of a doctor in a medical malpractice case where you haven't learned the medicine the doctor gives you an answer, and you go, oh. And if you know the medicine, you know that's not a correct answer, you can follow up on it. Same thing goes for a product's case where you're deposing a design engineer. You must know the principles. And if you know the principles of design engineer, Aaron, and I've given you a list of foreign questions, that I like to ask, and they're all leading cross-examination, which we're allowed to do, as Brian pointed out, at the deposition. And the deposition is what's going to make you, as Brian said, or break you. It's a, your whole roadmap for trial. Uh, now, I, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on direct examination of your expert at trial. What you do with your expert is uh, you get him up uh, and you get him to give his qualifications. And I've had some experts who are so well qualified. I, I really deviated from my general rule, which is not to spend a lot of time on it, and spend 20 or 30 minutes on the qualifications. Someone who was on the National Transportation Safety Board and and, uh, investigated the Exxon Valdez case and this one and that one, things everybody knew about. I want the jury to hear about that. And don't, and don't ever accept the stipulation that, like, I'll get up. I would never do it with John because he's laughing at me. But if I felt I had a less experienced attorney against me who had a good expert with uh, very good qualifications, I might try getting up and saying, your Honor, I want to move it along. Let's save some time. I'll stipulate it to its qualifications. <laughs> now, John would say to me, Mr. Gay, that's so nice of you, but I think it's important for the jury to hear this expert's qualifications. But don't ever accept, when you have a really good expert, a stip uh, that, that uh, the, the other side will, uh, will uh, stipulate that he, to his qualifications. It's true, the jury never hears them. And you've spent it now on this expert already. Uh, this one particular expert probably 
50, 75 thousand dollars already with all the models, the tests, the computer animation, and you're not going to have the jury hear his qualifications. You have to be out of your mind. That, that's going to really help you win your case. Now, uh, after the qualifications, what you want to do is you step back and you let the expert teach the jury. I like to get it. If, if, the, if, the, if the expert is where Brian is, I'll go way over here. I say, if you have to, can you come down and you can show us uh, with this model or on the blackboard or with the PowerPoints that we, all, that we use now? Uh, I'm still old school. I have my big blow-ups and everything, but whatever. But, or my model and say, could you explain to us uh, how your design works? And get out of the way. Let the expert teach. And, and don't, and that's how you want to do it. Uh, you, you want the expert as the teacher informing the jury about why this product was defectively designed and by the tests this expert made and the models he's recreated <coughs> and his design drawings and all of the pictures that we've taken right away, if we could get in there right away, why this uh, product uh, was defectively designed. Now, <laughs> the most important expert you will question, and you're going to do it at a deposition, because it, as I said, it's going to be your roadmap. It's going to be what you're, you're going to use to cross-examine the defense experts with, uh, as well as to impeach the design engineer at trial is your deposition of the design engineer or engineers who actually design the product. A lot of times, uh, defense counsel will produce someone from risk management or someone who had, had nothing with quality control. If I have a defective design, where a warrant case, I want the experts who, A, were involved in, intimately with the design of the machine and also with the writing of the warnings. I want their depositions and, and I, will, I want to get them. Now, in state court, that's, you're not going to ever get uh, uh, the deposition, depositions of, uh, of the defense experts and the defendants are going to get the depositions of your experts, but you get deposition of the design engineer and the warnings people. And that is your time to do the same type of cross that you would do at trial. And you're going to cross the expert on the principles of design engineering. And uh, I have a section uh, in here uh, I can't get, the pages probably are different, but it's called Use of the Principles of Safety Design uh, Engineering in a Product Liability Case Based on Negligent Product Design. So, you have to, what you have to do is this, if you haven't uh, learned it uh, all uh, previously, is you have to go and you go to some of the good engineering schools, Texas A&M, uh, whatever school it may be, and you look at the curriculum for engineering and specifically design engineering for the BS and uh, the masters and uh, the PhD usually doesn't have it because you'd be doing a thesis and you get a hold of those books and you read them and you learn them just like in a malpractice case where you're going to read all the medical journal articles and you learn it and you know it and if you, you do this enough you develop a whole cross examination because any legitimate expert, and I propose a lot of defendants design engineers, and every one of them has, has been honest with me about the basic principles of design engineering. And here's why it's important. In many of these cases, if not most of these cases, where someone is injured by a product, they didn't use the product properly. They, they made mistakes. They were at fault. So you have to develop a theme. And the theme is that, and you can use the warnings to do that. For instance, uh, there's a warning saying, in that skid steel loader case, there was a warning is, don't operate machine without uh, 
side screens in place <coughs> could result in injury and death with a big skull and crossbones. Okay. So I said, you know, I, John would have done but I get up on open and I say, you know, I anticipate uh, by virtue of the pleading papers that have been served and the depositions in this case, that the defendant is going to get up and tell you they had a warning there. And they did have a warning. And I want to tell you, they're going to say that warning said, don't operate this machine without the side screens in place because you could get killed. And they're going to say that plaintiff didn't follow, the decedent didn't follow those warnings. Ask yourself this. Shouldn't the real issue in this case be why they put this unreasonably safe product in the market with side screens that you could pop out like a window with no safety device to prevent the machine from operating? When they know, they admit, they have a warning, they'll kill you. Because this is where we get into ergonomics or human factors engineering. And it's, in Europe, it's ergonomics. In the United States, it's human factors. And it really involves the consideration by the design engineer of human factors and characteristics when designing a machine. Okay? Everybody will admit to it. It's taken into, consi in, in, into consideration. The cardinal principle of human factors engineering is that it's human nature to error. If we didn't make mistakes, if operators of machines or users of products didn't make mistakes, we wouldn't need guards or warnings or safety devices on any machine because we'd all have to 100% perfectly. Well, any dis ethical design engineer is going to admit when you ask him that uh, uh, an operator uh, using a machine with 100% uh, uh, properly is, is an unreasonable proposition. They're going, to, they're going to say, of course it is. And that's why they take it into consideration. And that's why they take, put warnings on machines. And that's why they should design a machine, if they can, to design out the hazard. Now, uh, OK, I have plenty of time. OK, <laughs> so listen, here's the thing. Uh, what's a hazard? A hazard is a condition that can cause an injury. Uh, what's a dangerous hazard? A dangerous hazard is where the risk of the pro or the probability of that hazard causing an injury rises to a certain level so that it becomes dangerous, okay? It can cause injury or death. Uh, and uh, <coughs> when a design engineer and every good manufacturer, and you're lucky if they don't, but every good one will have done a hazard analysis. And I know this morning you, they, you were told about discovery and all, and you will have gotten all your documents and your hazard analysis and all of the, all of the uh, uh, paper that went into the design of the machine, the blueprints, the schematics, and whatnot. So your only purpose, to, you have to think like in any deposition, why am I taking this deposition? This isn't a deposition of a design engineer, which you're taking to ask open-ended questions like, oh, how did this machine work? Explain to us how it worked. And s stupid questions like that. What do you care? You know how the machine works. He knows how it works. Your experts can explain how it works. You can ask him about that, but you want to nail the guy on the principles of the safety design engineering. And any design engineer is going to recognize what are called the pr principles of safety design engineering prioritization. And that is this. Once a hazard is recognized in a machine, a condition that has a probability of causing injury, what the, the obligation, the duty on the design engineer is to A, design out the hazard if you can do so uh, without destroying the utility or functionability of the machine. I word made that word up, functionability, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, that's the first priority. You ask a design engineer, they're going to say yes. Secondly, if you can't, if the design engineer can't uh, design out the identified hazard without destroying the ability of the machine to function, what's the next thing you do? He guarding. 
If you can't decide it out and you can't guard against it, what's the last thing you do? You warn it. That's a priority. And every design engineer will, will admit that because it's true. That's what they're taught. Uh, and I put at, uh, in the submission, I don't, it's pages 9 through 14, a list of sample questions that you should be asking in leading fashion, where you're giving them the answer almost. These questions based on the design engineering theory. So, just let me, and you pace them, you know what I'm saying? You, 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 you have to have a pace in these depositions. Uh, and also, in this, there's a, there's a uh, portion of a cross-examination of a design engineer who we brought over from Germany uh, in a printing press case incorporating the principles of design engineering. So you'll see that. that, that. But so, so you say, is it fair to say that before this machine uh, was, uh, was sold, a hazard analysis was done? Yes, and tell us what a hazard analysis is. And, uh, and, and part of the hazard analysis would be to associate, uh, to, 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 to uh, identify uh, hazards or that had a high probability of causing injury. True? And, 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 and would you agree that a hazard from a design engineering standpoint is a condition that has the potential of causing injury? Of course. Uh, would you agree as a, as a design engineer that once a hazardous condition is identified, and then you go through. First goal, design it out. Second goal, guard against it. Third goal, warn against it. Uh, uh, and then you go into ergonomics. Are you familiar with the concept of ergonomics, or human factors, as, as we call it here in the United States? Yes. And you studied it, didn't you? Yes. And uh, as a design engineer, when you design a product such as this, uh, you take into consideration that it would be used by people, yes. And you take into consideration that it would be used by people of all varying levels of intelligence and skill and education, true? Yes. In fact, when you design this machine, you design it for the lowest common denominator. You don't design it for the genius, do you? Objection. <laughs> right. So definitely, I can ask anything I want now. <laughs> Why the hell you? <laughs> you, you? You design this man for this machine for the stupidest person in the face of the earth. <laughs> and as a design engineer, you knew, didn't you, when you designed this machine that was human nature to air? Yes. And, and, and you took into consideration when you designed this machine, didn't you, that humans make mistakes? And, and, and in designing this machine, uh, when you put warnings into the manual, you did that because you knew that humans make mistakes. True? Yes. And, and we, would you agree that if we were all perfect and never made mistakes, you wouldn't need warnings, guards, nothing in anything, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. Now, and you know nobody's perfect, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, I, there's a whole list of them. I, I don't want to go through every one, but I want to try and find some that John's going to object to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think you found a few already. Tell me he was going to object. We need a, we're going to extend the conference another day so I can go over my objection. <laughs> okay, here's, a, here's one. Do you agree that it is the ethical responsibility of a safety design engineer, such as yourself, to develop a safe, functional machine design which eliminates or greatly reduces the Let me say this. God forbid that John McDonough interrupt Tony Gear after that introduction, and he is a national name in product. But let me just say this. And with all due deference to uh, what the rules are with respect to, uh, particularly in the federal court, uh, in regard to the conduct of depositions, there are rules, if you look at them carefully, about uh, when people can be compelled to give opinion testimony, uh, both the trial and, secondly, you have an ethical obligation to represent the client. So there are rules with respect to what can be asked, what can be objected to, what, what you can direct or what you cannot direct the answer. But your ultimate uh, fiduciary obligation is to the client. 
Absolutely, and John is absolutely correct. And the fact is, though, there's a lot of case law on this, and I've litigated this a lot, and Brian will know more about it than me. You bring in a design engineer, you're allowed to ask that design engineer who actually designed the, uh, the product opinion questions, this year, as you're allowed to ask a defendant in a medical malpractice cases, expert questions. And you're allowed to do that, and I've never lost a motion on that. Have you? Well, you don't do motions. Court of Appeals says you win. So yeah, you win. Court of Appeals says it, of course. Uh, okay, so those are the type of questions. But you can't ask those questions unless you learn this stuff. I've been studying safety design engineering for over 30 years. I love it. I like it better than law. I mean, <laughs> it's incredible stuff, and it's great. It's a, once you learn it and the concept, and then, you, and then you can also get these really good engineers that you've retained to educate you even more. Sometimes you have to educate them a little. They forgot what they learned in school. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, the purpose of all of this is from opening, from deposition, through opening, through cross, through summation, is this theme. You're going to have in 90% of these cases a plaintiff or decedent who didn't use the machine properly. You're going to have a jury who's going to at the outset say, hey, this is a major corporation. They knew what they were doing. You have to overcome that. And the way you overcome that is by your theme that they identified this hazard. They put warnings on it. The warnings were inadequate. And they also could have designed, either designed out the hazard, or they could have put in proper guarding, and in addition to proper warnings. And that's going to be your theme. And that's how you're going to overcome. Because don't forget. Culpable conduct is a defense to strict liability to a product liability case in New York. So that's the theme, and that's how you deal with it. Now, one thing. Tell me what I thought. Uh, yeah, one, four. Okay, one thing. It's Very, seven for you. Seven. Okay, seven. Uh, <laughs> one thing. And Brian was talking about this. If you have a foreign manufacturer, let's say a German manufacturer, who has a subsidiary in the United States who uh, sells the machines in the stream of pro commerce and who you could uh, who would be liable for for uh, for, uh, for 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 a, a negligent design in this case in the case don't just sue that defendant because you're never going to get the deposition of the design engineer because the design engineer is over there in Germany. You have to go through the Hague Convention. You have your tr complaint translated into German. You know the whole thing. You go to a company like APS and you do your thing. You serve them so they're in the case so you can get that guy to come from Germany or Japan or wherever, not China. But we, have, we there's a different, I don't have time to tell you how we deal with that. But. Uh, but then you get the design engineer, and you do not give up till you get the deposition of the design engineer, because Brian told you it is the most important thing in the case. And if you've successfully busted diversity, and I've had an airplane litigation case once where I was removed three times based on fraudulent joinder, and I was remanded every time. And on the last motion, the federal judge uh, excoriated because I really had a real defendant who made a component part who happened to be a New York company. And they really did have something to do with it. But it, it, so that's another consideration in taking a case if you're not going to be able to bust diversity because the cost of the case goes through the roof because of all the expert depositions. You have to give reports. <laughs> These experts, before you know it, it's $10,000 for a report. Net, forget about the $50,000 to build the model or, the, or do the drawings or whatnot. Now, demonstrative evidence is I've, uh, demonstrative evidence is, as you, is your imagination. And, and, and uh, you can think of anything. One thing you want to do is uh, you want the expert to have done uh, videos or computer animations of the design shows how it works. You would have had to build it this way. It gets so expensive. Since I only have now about four minutes, probably two, but uh, 
Let me tell you this. Uh, and Joanne Bell said she was in this case, uh, involved in this case, and Brian Stapleton, who was involved, in, was here this morning, was involved in this case. Fortunately for me, they were contractors, and they were, it was a job site injury on, with a crane where a guy lost his leg. Uh, and I brought them in, not Joanne, I can't remember what, I think Joanne got out, but uh, Brian from Goldberg's Gala was in as a contractor, and he was in under a 200, labor law 200 cause of action, and he was in because he was a New York corporation, I busted diversity, but he was a legitimate defendant because I did not want to be in federal court in this case. So, these guys, this was National Council Healing, so we had a failure to warn claim, and they, I took the design engineer, Another guy from uh, Europe, I don't really want to name the country, but he, he came in, I took him, I did my usual shtick, and you'll see it in the materials, and it, it worked out very, very well, but they never wanted to pay money in the case. They made a very grave mistake. They hired local counsel, excellent local counsel, and they used them as runners. And I saw one of the senior partner from that firm at the dinner last night for the trial lawyers and I said, Doing it. And he's still doing work for these guys. I said, he said, are they still not letting you do anything? Yep. I said, that, <laughs> that was so lucky for me. So anyway, <laughs> we had a failure to warn claim. Guy is an oiler on a crane. I'll wrap it up. Guy is an oiler on a crane. An oiler maintains the crane. This is a huge mobile boom crane. And the operator is operating it, and he, and he uh, swings, swivels the boom. Uh, Slew, so it slew the boom, they call it in, 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 in Europe. And he doesn't realize that the oiler has decided to get up on the deck and change your air filter and psh, takes his leg off. Uh, we, were, we argued and I had a guy build it uh, that, uh, that, that it should have had a self-actuating uh, cutoff device that, that uh, that uh, I'm not se a self-actuating device that sounded an alarm when the boom swooped. Off. No crane manufactured anywhere in the world has that. But that was our design. And we also had a very, very good failure to warn case. And this is what we did. So I can show you how you can use your imagination. Uh, this was the manual for the crane. Okay, it's like 1,200 pages. And it's, well, everything's lumped together. Warnings, uh, how to, when to maintain it, uh, parts list, everything. And the warnings, the little warning, there's little warnings in here with danger and black saying, uh, don't do this, you'll be dead. Uh, so, so what did we do? And I cross-examined the guy on this, too, on this thing, which was really good for me, because it had everything we were saying could happen, warned about it. Hey, you warned about it, why didn't you put this thing in? So what did we do? I said, you really expect that someone's going to read this? I said, it took me 24 hours to read this the first time. And I must have read this manual 10 times. But you think this guy with a high school education who's an operating engineer is going to read this manual? So here's what we did. We, had our, we hired a warnings expert, a really good guy, very PhD, highly qualified, because. I knew that they had good experts like John would have, and I have to have my good experts. By the way, sometimes I like to get two uh, design engineering experts who are both qualified. So on the motion for summary judgment, when I will have to put the affidavit in, I will have served my 3101s for everybody. But when I have to put the affidavit in, I do it for one. And then when I don't, that case came down in May where What's the court? Well, it's very hard to win the, for defendants to so. kick us out. And I always forget the name of it. That, the one in May by the Court of Appeals for the design defects, summary judgment. Oh, yeah. You know what? It's yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's very hard for them to win. In any event, uh, so, uh, so what, what did I do? I, I sat down with our warnings expert, and he took this manual, and he took out from the manual the safety instructions, the warnings, and we created what we call the Basic Crane Operating Instructions Manual. And it's all, and now the anti-standards with signal words, the, the new revised standards do require color in certain places, as John will tell you as well. But we created this manual, and let me tell you what happened. 
And this is why I'm lucky I didn't have a guy like John against me. Uh, or, 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 or lucky that Joanne Bell wasn't uh, representing the manufacturer. So they vote for summary judgment. We put in our affidavits and everything. And, we, and they dis moved to dismiss everything. And we put this in together with our experts affidavit and say, they, this is what they should have done. Do you believe that on their reply, they withdrew that portion of their motion on the failure to warn claim? No, I never heard of that. I mean, John, <laughs> I would never do that. But they did it. And uh, that case, because of the deposition, because all the work we did, I really didn't want to settle the case. We were in front of a judge in Brooklyn, really wanted to give it a shot. I had a guy who was 90% at fault for this action. Given we sell it for a very good number, uh, consider that because of that. But again, cross examination, you must learn what I was telling you. And I have it in the submission. I give you a basic discussion about the principles of safety design engineering. It whacked. That takes going, and that's how you handle the product liability case in 15 minutes. Thank you very much. <laughs>